Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another video of Fish Valley Podcast. Today I'm joined by Gary Greenberg, and today we're discussing his book, The Judas Brief, A Critical Investigation into the Arrests and Trials of Jesus and the Role of the Jews. Welcome back to the channel, Gary. Good to be back. Very good to have you here. So let's start off with this. Um, did Judas actually betray Jesus? No. It wasn't even close. And uh, the word used for betray is misrepresented. Uh, it means hand over. Uh, and the word is used inconsistently in the Gospels. Uh, they sort of shift the t sense of it when they talk about Judas uh, as opposed to using it in other contexts. What is historical about the trial of Jesus? And what do you think might be an exaggeration? Well, the entire Jewish proceeding is nonsense. It never happened. It wouldn't have happened. Uh, there's no historical reason why it should have happened. Uh, the closest you get to what might have happened is John's Gospel, uh, where the council meets to discuss not the threat from Jesus to them, which is the synoptic thesis, but the threat to Rome wanting to destroy the temple because of Jesus. So what happens is in, the, uh, in John's gospel is uh, God plants a uh, prophecy in Caiaphas's head and says, well, if we sacrifice one person, we could save uh, the country. That's much closer to what probably happened, although that too isn't exactly what happened. It's close though, and it's not far out of the range when you get the true story of what took place. Is there historical evidence uh, about the trial that can be found in sources like the Gospel of Peter that you talk about, or, are there, or, or is that information found in those sources basically useless? The Gospel sources are largely useless uh, for any form of history, at least the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, they're terrible history, and they're wrong about almost everything. And the most important problem, I think, is that there's absolutely no reason why uh, the Jewish council would have had any problems with Jesus at all. There are a lot of Jewish factions. There are a lot of guys running around claiming that they were going to tear down the walls and kick out Rome and so on. And they had no problem with any of them. They accepted anything that was pretty much based on any legal concept, and that was pretty wide-ranging. There was nothing about Jesus that was a threat to anybody. So what do you think he was actually put on trial for? He was not put on trial. That's, uh, I think, a key point. And... Uh, John, in John's gospel, there is no trial. Uh, there's just a meeting of the council well before Jesus is arrested. Jesus isn't even there. Uh, the closest thing you come to a trial in John is uh, the high priest where John is waiting. John is brought, uh, Jesus is brought to the high priest's house. And the high priest says, uh, so what's your ideas about? And Jesus says, well, I've been talking about it over and over. Ask other people. And a soldier slaps him for being rude to the high priest. Jesus replies, nothing rude. 
And that's about it. There is, there was never a trial. Uh, and the story is just thoroughly wrong. Uh, Jesus, uh, Judas was not betraying Jesus. Uh, that's not what the story was about. So what do you think is, uh, that Judas's actual role really is? Judas, who appears to have been a relatively trusted advisor, who was actually in charge of the uh, group's finances, um, was acting as a mediator. You had a very tense situation going on. This was the Passover holiday. And the Romans were always very sensitive to the Passover holiday because it's a holiday promoting revolution against the ruling government, uh, like Egypt. And so there were a lot of uh, Roman military moved into Jerusalem during the Passover holidays every year. And the Romans just simply didn't like anyone that had a following who wasn't approved. Jesus had a following, and he wasn't approved. Uh, and there, according to the Gospels, uh, there was uh, a revolutionary named Barabbas who had just been arrested possibly for killing somebody for as a revolutionary act, killing a, probably a Roman soldier. And so things were on tenterhooks, very, very... Uh, worried about riots breaking out and if and the jewish council was pretty concerned about how they could avoid the riots they didn't want to pogrom by rome against the jews there have been experiences like that earlier in the history and so judas became something of a mediator he worked out, he was representing Jesus in discussions with both the high priest and uh, Pilate, trying to work out a deal where there would be no rioting, no arrest or anything. And what they worked out, according to my analysis, was that Judas would remain on the house arrest. Uh, Jesus would remain on the house arrest in the high priest's house, and Jesus would guarantee that his followers would promote no riots or do any kind of anti-Roman demonstration. And after the holidays, Jesus would be released, and everybody and he and his followers would go back to uh, Galilee. Uh, Pilate actually, as far as I can tell, signed on to that deal and said, well, that's okay. As long as there's no trouble, everybody can go home, we'll do this, and so on. The person who was angry was Herod, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who was the ruler of Galilee. Uh, Herod had already beheaded John. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, because John was leading opposition to Herod. And so the opportunity for violence with Herod was very real. Uh, anyone who was challenging Herod would have been a target. And we have in one episode in one of the Gospels that the Pharisees actually warned Jesus that he was a target from Herod. And so when Herod heard about this deal, and he would have been in uh, Jerusalem also for the holidays, he was furious. Uh, he wanted Jesus out of the way and out of his hair. And he made all kinds of threats against Pilate, uh, including threats of treason, if he didn't do something about uh, Jesus. And Herod was a higher ranking individual than Pilate was. Herod was a king, uh, but he was not in Galilee. He was in Judah, which is not his territory, but he was a highly influential person in Judea in the Roman government. 
And so uh, Herod was the one who pushed to break the deal. And Pilate, always looking for what's in his best interests and who was an extraordinarily corrupt and dishonest uh, governor, uh, just said, well, I'm not going to get in trouble. I'm going to break the deal. And when Jesus was arrested, uh, Herod, uh, Pilate ordered Jesus brought to him for a trial or at least a, an inquiry, an inquest. And that's when things turn sour. That's the truth behind the story in John's gospel of the, uh, the council worrying about what Rome was going to do. And it was the fear of Roman reaction that was the action. And the council decided that there would be riots from Rome. The Roman military would crack down on the Jews and there would be terrible deaths, a large number of deaths. And so they agreed to send Jesus over to Pilate, breaking the deal because of the threats of violence. And that's the approximate story that's behind the uh, story of Jesus and Judas. Why do you think that the Gospelists have decided to to portray Pilate in such a positive manner, contrary to that of people like Philo and Josephus and others who portray Pilate in such a negative manner? Because uh, they didn't want to get Rome angry. They were looking for a way to blame the Jews. The Jews were the real target of the Christians uh, or the Christian movement at that time. Uh, and that's where the divide comes. Uh, if a Jew didn't accept Jesus, he was evil, according to the Christians. And uh, that was the actual debate was going on. They had no truck with Rome. They didn't care about Rome, except if Rome was giving them grief. Uh, they needed to tack on to Judaism in order to get historical status as a religious group to keep Rome from cracking down on the Christians. And uh, so that's what you have. They didn't want to create a problem with the Romans. And they were writing long afterwards, and they were looking to blame the Jews, not the Romans. The Jews were the ones who were responsible, and God took away the covenant from them and gave it to Jesus and his followers. When do you think that the four Gospels were composed? John, uh, Mark is the earliest. Probably uh, scholars hesitate between during the rebellion or after the rebellion of 65. Um, Matthew was probably written in the 80s. There's a trend now in scholarship to date Luke later and later. There's some good evidence that Luke made use of uh, Josephus' histories. And if he did, that would put him in the 90s to the 100s. Uh, and John was probably written in the 90s to the 100s. So we're talking a long way after, uh, after the death of Jesus at least 55, 60 years at the earth for Mark. So a lot of things are going on during that time period. And uh, however, if you recall from our earlier interview, I wrote a book on the proto-gospel called the proto-gospel, which was the right. source pretty much for all the other gospels. And there's a good possibility that it was written prior to Paul's letters. And Paul's letters are in the 50s, so that creates a much earlier uh, version of the gospel story. I'd like to ask about Philo. You mentioned that Philo was quoting a letter from Agrippa, and some scholars mm -hmm. questioned uh, whether it were historically accurate or not. 
in a chapter discussing is Pilot really that bad? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, Pilot really was that bad. Uh, uh, he had a terrible reputation for taking bribes, for murdering people he didn't like. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that some followers of Jesus gave Pilate a bribe to let them take Jesus off the cross before he was dead. Uh, uh, but we have the letter from Agrippa. And since that letter was sent to the Roman government, uh, to uh, Claudius, who was, I think, tight with Agrippa, uh, there's no doubt that it would have been a legitimate letter, because if it wasn't, the Romans would have known it was illegitimate. Uh, so we do have that historically. I mean, he's only writing a few years after uh, Jesus is removed, uh, after Pilate has been removed for murdering a Samaritan prophet uh, and sent back to Rome. Um, so, uh, so Pilate really was that bad. The letter from Agrippa really is historical because uh, it would have existed in written form in Rome. And Agrippa isn't going to, you know, make up a story that's going to be easily fact checked. Why did some scholars doubt the uh, the accuracy of Philo's reporting of the contents of Agrippa's letter? Because they want to keep the uh, keep the pilot in good standing and keep the Jews as the bad guys. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the letter is legitimate. So they, um, does the Alpha Gospel, because I kind of want to ask about that, uh, also go along with the idea from what you can tell that Pilate is evil? Or does it start detracting from it? The uh, Alpha Gospel, or what I call the Proto Gospel, um, is mostly in line with uh, the synoptic versions uh, because Mark didn't make that many changes to it. Um, but it's very different from John's version. I mean, most scholars are pretty aware that John has a very different version of the Passion account. And they're trying to figure out where he gets it from. I say it's because he hates the Alpha Gospel and the synoptic versions of the Gospel and was rewriting everything. In fact, one of the things you look at in John's Gospel is he has moved the trial of Jesus from a council to just an argument on the street. The same thing that was happening in the council is reduced to a street argument in John. Uh, John is rewriting the gospel, the Alpha gospel, the synoptic gospels, in order to exonerate the Jews. Uh, his thesis was that God had a plan. The plan was that Jesus would be put to death and publicly rise up after his death. And that only God could have made that happen. And that would prove that Jesus was God's representative. Um, anything that got in the way of that thesis was altered by John. John had no, didn't believe that there was anything wrong with what the Jews were basically doing. Um, despite some of the arguments about the, when he, shouts out about the uh, Jews are related to the devil. There's a big story behind that one also. Um, 
So uh, John has a very has rewritten the entire Passion account uh, to take away the liability of the Jews. What do you think that Jesus historically actually most likely did that caused him to get arrested in the first place? Uh, well, the arrest was due, you know, whether it's my theory or any other, uh, because the Romans were unhappy with people who had a popular following. It didn't matter what they were teaching. Uh, if you weren't authorized to be a leader, uh, you couldn't, they didn't want you going around leading a crowd. So they would arrest you, charge you for some crime. And we have a lot of evidence historically that that's what the Romans were doing with uh, popular leaders. Uh, as I said, the Jews had no reason to arrest Jesus. There was nothing unusual about what Jesus was teaching uh, from a Jewish perspective. And it was only because initially, from my viewpoint, the deal had been worked out for the high priest to hold Jesus under house arrest until after the holiday. And then when uh, Herod forced Pilate to break the deal, that's when things got set in motion. Uh, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. He may have been apocalyptic if he, uh, thinking that things were coming to a head, he turned, he apparently interpreted events perhaps uh, as signs that we were coming on the end days. Um, but, you know, there was nothing particular unusual. I don't think he claimed to be the Messiah. I think he was like John the Baptist in some ways. Uh, he was probably a student of John the Baptist. And they were basically preaching, you know, the end times might be coming. You better get right with God and do the get yourself together so that you could be saved. I don't think he claimed to be a Messiah, but I think people thought he was a Messiah. Uh, but that was a common kind of thing breaking out a lot in uh, Jerusalem in those days and years. And my closing question. What is the Septuagint problem that you discuss in the book? The Septuagint problem? Refresh my recollection. I'm trying to find it again. One second. Yeah, it's in page 43. Another sort of problem that affects the matter of the historical accuracy of the Gospels involves the reliance of the evangelists and early Christians on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, which were written almost certainly in Hebrew. Oh, okay, I got the context, yeah. Uh, the Septuagint problem is that it's not an accurate reflection of the Masoretic text, which is the text that would have been used by the Jews. Um, the quality, it's just wrong about many things. In other words, Jesus would not have been arguing from the Septuagint. He was Aramaic and Galilee. The Septuagint was circulated for the Greek-speaking peoples. The gospel authors are all in the Greek world, and they're using the Septuagint as their source because uh, they don't know how to read the Hebrew Bible. And if Jesus made any of the arguments that are frequently put into the Gospels, uh, they would have been laughing him out of the synagogue. Uh, they would have considered his arguments absolutely <laughs> ridiculous uh, because he's just wrong about what the Bible is saying in many places if you go by the Masoretic text. If you think the, uh, the Septuagint is an accurate translation of the Bible, uh, then you have a different issue. But uh, 
the general trend is that the Masoretic is more reliable than the Septuagint. Um, so you do have that kind of a, a, an issue. And the, the Bible itself was rather fluid at that time. Books were being canonized, but not necessarily the text in the books. So there may not have been any official approved version of the specific text of any book. The general text, as long as it was with, consistent with what was in the books, would have been acceptable. And then they would have tried to figure out what the specific was, uh, kind of like modern scholars in some way. Um, but you have a big gap with the gospel authors using the Greek's translation, which was inconsistent with the Hebrew text in order to make put words in Jesus's mouth. Jesus would not have been using a Septuagint argument. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.